Hey everyone, welcome to my digital breakout session. My name is Daniel Young. I'm the director of student ministries at Eagle Brook Church. The Eagle Brook Church is a multi-site church with campuses all around the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. And I'm really, really excited to get to share with you today, wherever you are, however you're watching this digital breakout. Now I titled this breakout, Saving the Soul of Student Ministry. And here's why. Because I believe if you are in student ministry, you got into this because you care about souls. You want to see souls saved. You want to see people hear the gospel, have a chance to respond and make Jesus their Lord and Savior. You want to see souls saved. You want to see people experience rebirth. You want to see them experience salvation. And you want to see souls healed. You want to see souls set free. You want to see souls transformed. You want to see people's lives change. In order to see somebody's life transformed, life saved, life healed, we know you gotta deal with the soul. But here's the real reason why I titled this breakout Saving the Soul of Student Ministry. It's because while so many of us, we got into student ministry because we wanna see souls saved and changed and healed, so often we neglect our own souls. And what I want to do is just take some time in this breakout to break down and really maybe just pause and bring our attention back to the fact that we cannot truly impact other people's souls if we neglect the health of our own. I'm going to say that again. In this world of church ministry where we get so busy and we get so focused on things like strategies and metrics and outcomes and decisions, I want us to just pause. Maybe some of you, you need to take a deep breath. And we all just need to be reminded that we cannot truly impact other people's souls while we neglect our own. So that's why I want to talk to you for the time we have together about saving the soul of student ministry. And it starts by saving the souls of student pastors and student leaders. And no, I don't mean we all need to get saved again. We all need to be born again in terms of salvation. I think it means, man, we need to pay attention to the health of our own souls. See, the health of your soul, it matters for more than just you. I believe the health of your soul matters to your family, matters for your ministry, and ultimately the health of your soul matters for the kingdom of God. If you are going to reproduce other disciples whose souls are healthy and strong and aligned with the Spirit of God, you have to have a soul that's healthy and whole and aligned with the Spirit of God. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, the story we're all probably familiar with is Jesus calling some of his first disciples. Here's what it says. It says, And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. In the boat with Zebedee was their father, and this is what I want us to focus on. What were they doing when Jesus found them and called them? It says they were mending their nets. And that word in English, mending, is translated from the Greek word katartizo. Yes, we're going back to Greek school, for some of you. That Greek word katartizo gets translated here as mending, fixing, to make whole or make ready. That's what Jesus found his disciples doing when he called them. And if you remember, what did he call them to do? These guys who were fishing for fish, he said, come, I want you to fish for men. See, as disciples, Jesus calls people. He says, hey, I want you to come and I want you to fish for men. And I don't think it's an accident that what we find them doing is mending their nets, fixing their nets, making their nets ready. Why? Because in order to fish, they had to cast out their nets. And the net that God uses to cast out and bring souls to him is the lives of his people. See, his disciples form the net that God has cast into the world to bring lost people back to himself. And what are the disciples doing with these nets? They're mending them. Because a broken net doesn't catch very many fish. See, a broken net really is an ineffective way of fishing. And the same thing is true of God's people. If we are the net, if disciples of Christ are the net that he's casting into the world to bring people to himself. Man, he needs our lives to be whole. He needs our net.
to be mended. That's the point. And then the net really is a necessity in fishing. It was, it was a true necessity back in this time, but even still, fishing is a necessity. I don't know how many watching this are into fishing, but I grew up in Minnesota, but I didn't really understand the importance of a net for fishing until I moved to Florida. So I lived in Florida and did ministry there for about 10 years. And there's actually a huge difference fishing in a lake in Minnesota and fishing in the ocean in Florida. There's a huge difference. I didn't realize until I moved to Florida. So growing up in Minnesota, if we we're going to go fishing, uh, we would fish for one kind of fish, mostly. We, we, we knew that, that every fish, you, you need a specific tackle, you need specific lures, you need a specific setup, even rods, reels, all that stuff, you would gear toward a specific fish. If we're going to fish for northern pike, man, I need a northern setup. Man, if I'm going to go fish for bass, I need a bass fishing setup. That's how we fished in Minnesota. And we honestly, we didn't use nets that often growing up in Minnesota because we knew what we were fishing for. But in Florida, it was so different. In Florida, particularly fishing in backwater in Florida, you put a shrimp on a hook or you put a little white bait fish on a hook and you throw that thing into the water, there is no telling what you might pull out. I mean, with a shrimp or a white fish, you might pull out everything from a flounder to a redfish. You might even catch a small shark on something like a shrimp or a white fish. So what I learned in Florida, is you have to have a net if you're gonna go fishing. In order to secure that fish, you don't know if that fish is gonna have teeth, you don't know uh, where its crush plate may be located in its mouth, you need to have a net if you are gonna land that fish fishing down in the salt water in Florida. So a net is absolutely essential, and I believe the net that God designed, the essential net that God designed is his people, and it's essential. So where do we come into this as church leaders? Man, if God's disciples are his net, look at our role, church leaders, with God's net and casting it out, catching fish. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. In verse 12, it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, which is the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints. Church leadership is designed for one purpose, and it's to equip the saints. Now, what is that word, equip, in the original Greek? It's the word katartismos. See, mending in Matthew 4 is katartizo. And this word that gets translated equip in Ephesians 4 is katartismos. It's the same root word, the same general concept. See, to equip the saints, to equip God's people, to equip the net, man, it involves mending. It involves caring. It involves helping people experience healing from their brokenness and fixing the broken places of the net. It says we're to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Jesus called disciples to be fishers of men, and he's called leaders in his church to be menders of nets. Our role is to make sure that God's people, their souls are healthy and thriving, they have a clear understanding of the gospel and a connection with Jesus. But here's my question to you, church leader. Here's my question to you, student pastor. How can we help mend other people's souls if we're not mending our own, if we're not paying attention to our own? So here's what I believe. I want to encourage you, if you're taking notes, to write this down. I believe the greatest gift you can give the people you lead is the health of your own soul. The greatest gift you and I can give the people we lead, whether we lead staff or whether we lead volunteers, the greatest gift we can lead the pe give the people we lead is the health of our own souls. It's for ourselves to be mended. It's for ourselves to be equipped and whole. But here's what I also know. The most difficult person you will ever lead is you. The most difficult kind of leadership, <coughs> excuse me, is self-leadership. Man, it starts with us. And the person looking in the mirror is the hardest person to lead. It's the hardest soul to take care of. Caring for others well means caring for yourself well. And sometimes it can be so much easier to spend our time, our focus, our energy, paying attention to other people, caring for other people's souls while we neglect our own. My wife uh, is actually a pretty good example of this. My wife is geared toward, oriented toward helping others 
She's just constantly thinking, how's everyone else feeling? How's everyone else doing? And what that means is she tends to not pay attention to how she's doing. My wife is also uh, educated as a nurse. She's got a degree in nursing. And my wife will know exactly what someone around her needs. If they get hurt, if they're sick, she will take the best care of our kids. She'll make sure I do whatever I need to do to recover. But when she gets sick or when she gets hurt, she just, I tease her all the time. I'm like, babe, you gotta take care of yourself first before you take care of others. And I don't know when the last time you took a plane ride was, but what do they say? If the cabin loses pressure, whose mask are you supposed to turn on first? Put on first yours. Because what the airlines know is something I think we all need to be reminded of. You can't take care of someone else if you're suffocating. How can you care for the soul of someone around you if your soul is suffocating? You need to pay attention to your own soul. We need to save the soul of student ministry by starting by paying attention to ourselves. So you can't give what you don't have. This is just a basic reality of life. If I have zero dollars, Guess how many dollars I can give you if you're in need? Zero. You cannot give what you don't have. And the same thing is true of our souls. If you don't have a healthy soul, you cannot give health to those around you. Uh, somebody that I follow when it comes to things about paying attention to our soul and leading ourselves is a guy named Lance Witt. He's written a couple books. He travels around and consults with pastors and leaders all on this idea of taking care of our own souls. He says this, trying to lead others to spiritual transformation while neglecting my own soul leaves me feeling hollow and disingenuous. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but I know what it feels like to preach things to people that I know I'm not practicing. It's not a good feeling. It leaves me feeling hollow and disingenuous. And the reality is we minister most out of our soul, out of who we really are where we're really at. And if your soul is tired or sick or neglected, guess what you're going to pass on? You're going to turn out leaders and disciples whose souls are sick and tired and exhausted. And so what I want to do just for the next few moments we have together is talk to you about three pillars of soul health, three pillars, three ways that we can save the soul of student ministry by starting with ourselves. So the first pillar I want to talk to you and taking care of your own soul and your own soul health is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. First pillar is you have to take personal responsibility for the health of your own soul. Take personal responsibility for the health of your own soul. One of my favorite authors, writers, uh, therapists, Dr. Henry Cloud says this, you are ridiculously in charge of your own soul. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? I mean, you can feel like people are in charge of, especially as student pastors, like someone else is in charge of just about everything we do. Someone else can be in charge of our calendar. Someone else is in charge of telling us when we need to have service. Someone else is in charge of telling us, man, what's the vision for the church? What should some of the strategies be that I'm implementing? It feels like as a student pastor in general, you're pulled in so many different directions and told what to do by so many different people that can leave you feeling like you're not in control. But the truth is, someone else might have some say over your calendar or the vision, or the strategies that you implement, but no one else has control of your soul. You're ridiculously in charge of your own soul. See, as Christians, we wanna be self-giving. We wanna help those around us, but we can't give well if we aren't well. It is not selfish to pay attention to our soul. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about soul care, any, any time a conversation about self-care comes up in Christian circles, there's always some people that get a little nervous, like, man, isn't this selfish? Isn't this actually, is this maybe narcissism? No, it's not. It's the opposite of narcissism. You know what self-care is? It's not selfish. It's stewardship. So we're really comfortable talking about stewardship when it comes to finances. We know everything we've been given is from God. And our job is to steward it well for his kingdom. But what if I told you the greatest resource you've been given to steward for God's kingdom is not your money, it's you, it's your soul. See, we are the greatest resource God has given us to impact the world, ourselves. But it's not selfish to take care of your soul. It's good stewardship. 
But in order to do that, no one else is going to steward your finances for you. And no one else is going to steward the state of your soul for you either. So if we're going to be good stewards of our soul, we have to take personal responsibility for the health of our own soul. Here's what else I know. No one else is going to care for your soul like you can. No one else is going to care about your soul more than you do. If you are going to hold your breath waiting for someone else to care for your soul, you're going to pass out. Because only you can do it. Only you can take care of your soul. See, if you wanted to get more healthy physically, if you said, man, I'm starting new year, new me. It's time for a new year's resolution. I'm going to get fit. I'm going to get healthy. Someone could come up with a fitness plan for you. Someone could come up with a diet plan for you. But no one can exercise for you. No one can eat for you. Only you can. You are in ridiculous control of your body and you are in ridiculous control of your soul as well. <clears throat> so, the first pillar of soul health, first pillar of saving the soul of student ministry by starting with you, is you need to take personal responsibility for the health of your own soul. The second pillar is this. You have to identify the toxins that are poisoning your soul. You gotta take some time. You gotta get introspective. You have to identify the toxins that are poisoning your soul. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, it says this. I think a lot of us hear this verse and we think of it one way, but I want us to think of it in terms of toxins that poison our soul. Here it is. It says, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Notice what that says. Cleanse ourselves from everything. So often when we hear this verse, our mind goes to sin. Our mind goes to wrong thought patterns, wrong speech patterns, wrong patterns of behavior. But this says cleanse ourselves not just of sin, but of everything that what? That defiles or poisons or harms our body or spirit. See, there's more than just sin that can poison our soul. There's other toxins that we pick up. There's trauma. There's stuff that, that's picked up from our family of origin. There's experiences. There's ways of thinking that are wrong and hurtful and harmful that we don't even realize. Maybe because that's how we were raised or that's the culture that we're in every day. So we need to identify the toxins that are poisoning our soul because here's how the verse continues. It says, cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. See, when someone ingests a poison or a toxin, there's a natural response of the body to expel it. It's kind of gross, it's intense. That response is to vomit. Literally, your body recognizes a, a toxin so powerfully that it will it'll lurch and it'll vomit and it'll try to expel it. I wonder, do we take toxins against our soul that seriously? I mean, vomiting is nasty and it's uncomfortable and it's gross and it's painful. It's a process our body knows it has to go through in order to not be damaged. Are we willing to go through something maybe that's ugly? It's not pretty, it's painful. In order to expel some toxins from our souls. And maybe you're dealing with a toxic relationship, toxic attitude, toxic mindset, some toxic trauma that you've never faced or dealt with. Are you willing to do the painful thing to expel it? Because here's the unfortunate reality. If you aren't willing to do the painful thing to expel the toxins, chances are someone else is gonna come along and force the issue. See, a few years back, my kids were really little their great-grandparents came into town. And it was awesome. We we're doing all the things that you do with great-grandparents, having fun, making memories. And I was actually at church serving on a Sunday morning. It was a baptism weekend. I was pumped up. People are declaring uh, that they belong to Jesus through the sign of baptism. And I was pumped. And I got a phone call from my wife. She said, Daniel, it's, in, it's an emergency. Our kids swallowed their great-grandmother's medication. See, Ashley's grandma, my wife's grandma had left her pill box out on a bed and our kids found it. And she, she had some really intense medication, some stuff like blood pressure medication uh, and other things that are really dangerous mixed in with these bright red capsules that were just cranberry pills. 
My kids, they saw the bright red cranberry pills and they thought it was candy, so they ate all of them. <coughs> Every single one. They ate all the pills. My wife called me in a panic. Daniel, it's an emergency. Our kids swallow pills, come home right away. So I panic, I freak out. They ended up getting calling 911, getting an ambulance to come to our house to take our kids to the hospital. And what I'll never forget about this was these toxins in my kids' systems were so powerful, when they got to the hospital, the nurses and the doctors, they weren't concerned with my kids' comfort. They were trying to save their lives. So they literally, I mean, they were rough with my kids. My daughter to this day is traumatized about needles or anything sharp because they were trying to find her little veins and they kept poking her over and over and over for this IV. It was terrible. It was horrible to watch as a dad. But they knew they had to expel those toxins no matter what. And they were not as gentle as I would have been. See, if you are gonna be willing to do the hard work, if you will identify your own toxins, if you will take a moment and find out, then what are the things that could potentially be poisoning and damaging your soul? You are gonna be a lot more gentle with yourself than someone in the future may be. See, life has a way of exposing the things that we need to expel. But man, if you don't deal with it yourself, the chances are the process that God ultimately uses to expel those toxins may be more uncomfortable. So my challenge to you, identify the toxins that are poisoning your souls. See, part of that means becoming a student of your own soul. Do you pay attention to your own hardwiring? Do you pay attention to your own personality? Do you know uh, your family of origin and some of the habits, some of the culture, some of the things that have been passed down, down to you without even realizing it. You gotta become a student of your soul, which means paying attention to your hardwiring, paying attention to your family of origin. Here's a quote that I love from Pete Scazzaro. He's the author, author of the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He says this, you may have Jesus in your heart, but grandpa is still in your bones. Here's what he means by that. You can get saved. You can be reborn through a relationship with God, through hearing the gospel and believing in Jesus. But there is still a lot of hard work that's going to go into undoing patterns of thinking, speaking, and behaving that got passed down from generation to generation in your family history. Are you a student of your own soul? Do you know your own tendencies? Do you know uh, your bent, what, what things you tend to go toward that are unhelpful or harmful? Do you know your hardwiring? Are you a student of your own soul? And then here's the third and final pillar that I want to talk to you about. This one, uh, th this one, they really kind of build on each other, these pillars. They're kind of like steps on a soul health journey. The idea of taking personal responsibility for your soul. Then identifying, man, what are the things that are causing damage to me and my interior life and my soul and my spirit, the deepest part of who I am. And then the third one is when you begin to move forward. It's when you begin to build. It's when you begin to integrate things into your life that really help you not just get, stop being un unhealthy, but help you get healthy, help you get stronger, help you get your soul in a place where you are literally overflowing with just the, the spirit of God and with kingdom principles being on display in your life. Third pillar is this, begin to integrate authentic spiritual practices. Integrate authentic spiritual practices. And I use those words on purpose because there are so many different things uh, that we're surrounded by all the time that maybe don't actually help us form an authentic connection with God's spirit. There may be things that we feel like we should do or we have to do or we've seen somebody around us do. That's why I'm talking about integrating into your life authentic spiritual practices. What are some practices, some disciplines, some habits that really help you feel connected with God and help your soul to flourish? Here's a few things uh, I want to point out and why I word this point this way authentic spiritual practices. Because not all practices we do are authentic, meaning not all practices we do really help us form a connection with God. So many people 
in Christianity today are accumulating knowledge, but it's not actually changing them at a soul level. And here's why. Because accumulation is not the same thing as revelation. Just getting more and more information, knowledge about Jesus, knowledge about the Bible, does not immediately turn into transformation at the soul level. See, revelation, the idea of revelation is that something was covered and it now has been revealed. It's an uncovering. Revelation takes time. Simply accumulating information does not do the deep work of pulling apart some of the stuff that we need pulled apart or taking off some of the things we need taken off of us in order to really understand, oh man, that's what God's trying to do in my life. Accumulation is not the same thing as revelation. And so often we miss out on revelation because we're moving too fast. The reason we just keep accumulating, adding, 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 more information, more information, reading more books, doing more things, because we're in a hurry. But here's what I believe. Speed is the enemy of intimacy. If you're really going to be close and connected with someone, if you're really going to have an intimate relationship with someone, it requires slowing down. Imagine if every time I took my wife out on a date, I was in a hurry. Imagine if every time we were at dinner, I was like, uh, hey, uh, you think you could hurry that up? Think you could uh, bring, bring, it, bring it all. Bring the appetizer, bring the main course, bring the dessert all at once. Because uh, I got to go. We got to go. We got to go. Hey, uh, babe, you almost done? She's eating. I'm like, hey, are you, are you almost done? Is it, it, it's time to go. We, we got to go. Imagine if we're sitting watching a movie and I'm like, man, uh, you, you care if we leave halfway through the movie? Because, man, I'm, I, I got to go. I'm in a hurry. How good do you think my relationship with my wife would be if every time I spent time with her, I was in a hurry to do something else? Man, it would kill the intimacy in our relationship. But how many of us, that's exactly how we approach our spiritual practices. Man, I got to finish this quick Devo on the Bible app. Man, I got to hurry, hurry, hurry. Man, oh man, how long is this church service going to go? Man, they went past an hour and five minutes. This is crazy. It's going long. Or man, I got to pray. I got to get my list out to God. I got to let him know what I need him to do for me. And rather than taking time, slowing down, letting our soul align with God, we just constantly ask God to align with our agenda and our will rather than have our life align with his. See, some of the practices maybe you need to implement it's stuff like silence and solitude. It's sitting down and being quiet for a while. Just letting the Spirit of God speak to you. Maybe what you need to practice isn't necessarily this Bible reading goal where you're working through and you're pressing the dots and you're checking the boxes just to get it done. Maybe you need to set a slowing down goal this year. Maybe that's an authentic spiritual practice. For you. Accumulation is not revelation. Speed is the enemy of intimacy. And there's a huge difference between quality time and leftovers. See, another thing that would hurt my relationship with my wife, maybe I'm not in a hurry with her all the time, but the only time I spend with her is my leftovers. Man, if I give my best to work and my worst to my wife and kids, I'm not going to have a very intimate relationship with them. What's your quality time with God like? Is it truly quality? Or are you giving God your leftover time? So one of the things that gets talked about in church circles a lot is the idea of the tithe financially. Giving God the first fruits of our finances. But what if we focused on giving God also the first fruits of our time? Giving him quality, not leftovers. We need to authentic, integrate authentic spiritual practices. And here's another one. What if instead of reading the Bible informationally, we took time and slowed down and read the Bible relationally? Man, I remember a time years ago, I was, I was really getting into a hot topic. I was debating with some of my friends uh, and I was, I was really getting into theology. And I remember reading and pouring over scripture after scripture, spending probably about an hour and a half just studying and reading the Bible. I remember I closed my Bible and I just had this, this strong impression on the inside of me, like God was trying to get my attention. And the thought I had was, am I any closer to Jesus after that? Or am I just closer to being able to prove a point? See, I was reading the Bible informationally, 
but the design behind the Bible, the reason God gave us the gift of the Bible, his inspired word, is not just so that we could have more knowledge in our minds, so that our hearts could be transformed, so that we could sit with the scriptures, it's so that we could, we could really get to know Jesus more and read it relationally instead of just informationally. Another question I think that you can ask is, how is God coming to me now? I think that we need to, we need to focus on connecting with God differently in different seasons of our life. Just the same way that there are certain times, man, in our relationships where going out to eat is the best. Man, I want to go out, I want to take my spouse out to eat. And sometimes, man, I, what we need to do, we need to go out and we need to actually run errands. And some of the best date nights my wife and I have had is just walking through Target with none of our kids. It's amazing. And we really, we really feel connected walking through Target and talking because there's no distractions really. And sometimes it's just sitting next to each other, watching a show on Netflix. There are different ways that my wife and I feel more connected when we we connect and build intimacy with each other differently in different seasons of our life. I think it's the same with God. How is God coming to me now? What are the ways I really feel the Spirit of God speaking to me most clearly? Here's a question I want you to ask. This one is really kind of a rub where the rubber meets the road and where things get real question for all of us. If the people we're leading spend as much time with Jesus as I did, how much would they be growing? If the people I'm leading spend as much time with Jesus as I do, how much would they be growing? So man, we need to integrate authentic spiritual practices. So how do we save the soul of student ministry? And how do we have student ministries that really reach people? where we really see students saved and, and discipled and we see leaders find purpose and leading out of their God-given given giftedness. How do we see transformation happen and students become lifelong followers of Jesus? How do we save the soul of student ministry? Starts by paying attention to our own souls. Starts by becoming the kind of leaders who ourselves have mended nets and that we can go and mend the nets that Jesus wants to throw into the world to bring people unto himself. God bless you guys.